do is to create some sense of safety for your people um, because otherwise you just get blinkered, blinkered, um, blinkered thinking. And you, and you could extend that even to, to saying, you know, thank you for bringing that up. Not just it's okay to bring it up, but thank you for bringing it up. Um, because that's, that's something that we can then, we can then work towards solving. I, I tweeted something or tweeted or put on Instagram or something the other day, which I got a bit of, um, a bit of, of, a, of a confused response. Um, it was, uh, can I remember it? Can I remember my own thing? But basically it was along the lines of, um, if you're, if you're asking for help, then you're giving other people the opportunity to help you and people like to help other people. So, you know, be generous and ask for help and then be selfish and accept someone's offer of help or request to help rather. And I think that that's, that's something that, so that, and, um, I suppose as once you've got that safety, I think you then need space or capacity. I'm not sure the right word so that you can, you can explore it. That could be as well as the sort of mental capacity, but time, you know, um, we were in our little breakout room before we started, we were, uh, Luke was saying how uh, it'd be interesting to see what we lose if we go back to a normal way of working. And I think a lot of us were talking about how it is a little bit, it's, it's a little bit calmer work-wise because we know we can't do as much. And there's a sense of, a greater sense of allowance that we're giving our colleagues because we all know that we've got kids at home, we've got spouses at home, we're, we're not set up to work effectively, we don't have the tools and, and, and so, so we, we're giving it that sort of greater tolerance. And if we have that sense of always busy, even working on the commute, we don't necessarily have the time or the mental capacity to explore something tricky. No, where does that, I've just waffled there. Does that no, sound like it's going in the right direction? Definitely. That's why we've got you here to waffle. It's brilliant. So yeah, you talked about vulnerability, saying thank you, creating that space, and how always being busy doesn't really help with that. Yes. So the other thing was about sharing it, wasn't it? So you just share a problem so that we can collaborate on it. And it's all very well me being able to say I need some help with something or I don't know the answer to something. I mean, that's hard enough. But who, who to share that with, I think, is, is another sort of facet to this question. And if I don't know who has what skills or who has what experience, how do I know who to risk my vulnerability with, if you like? And a lot of the teams, a really simple exercise, it's not mine, it's just Lisa Atkins's the sort of journey lines to exercise, market of skills, things where you can just learn about people, not just in terms of the, the items on their CV, but their experiences, their personal skills, their traits, their, their uh, any, anything about them that, that could be useful, their mindset, their, their attitude. Um, that could be useful to us in, in solving a problem. The more we know what our colleagues and our friends have to bring to the party and the more we appreciate what they bring to the party and the more they're willing to bring those things to the party. That's two minute warning. Okay, so um, I might Kathy, ask... Kathy, that's two minutes. Yeah, do, do we want to just stop here then? Yeah, because we need to get to the doors. Yep. So are we actually physically going outside to do this? Well, I am, just to show sure. solidarity yeah. with my oh, community. Oh yeah, absolutely. I just wasn't yeah. sure if we were clapping here or... That's you fine. So <laughs> should, we all, should we all get to our doors then and come back in a couple of minutes? Cool. You see nice you shortly. Be back in a sec. Um, so, Jeff, so you finished up there talking us through a few ways of learning a bit more about people, not just about their work yep. and you touched on some of Lisa Radkin's tools. Is there anything else you want to say that or should we um, go to the group and see if anyone wants to ask a follow-up question? No, let's, uh, let's take it to the group, yeah. Cool. So if you want to raise your hand, if you had any questions specifically about that um, first question around encouraging people to share a problem. And Shane, you can maybe help me out if you can see hands.
No hands, guys. Must have nailed it then. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. We've got a pile of questions. Should we carry on then? Yep. So, next question. How do you deal with senior leaders who seem to have little or no interest in changing when going through agile transformations? Senior leaders, little or no interest. So it's difficult because my instinct is to ask some more clarity on that because how do you know that these senior leaders have little or no interest? Um, uh, appearances can be deceptive, but I suppose, you know, as the leader, I, I've, got to, I've got to be able to get across what I'm thinking, I've got to be able to connect with people and, 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 and explain and express how important it is. Um, well, the next thing that springs to mind is, um, did you say deal with? How do you deal with? Yeah, I suppose I'd, I'd, the next thing I'd be drawn to the language of uh, how do you deal with, with somebody. And well, it doesn't, well, to be honest, it doesn't matter who, who they are. Um, I, don't, I, I operate on the principle that I can't, convince anybody to have uh have more interest in something that interest has to come from within so i'd be i'd be keen to learn a little bit more about them um it, it wouldn't be too dissimilar to my first answer in some ways i'd like to learn a little bit more about the kind of leader that they are the kind of leader that they want to be the kind of organization they want to be part of leading um and if they can see rationale in changing the culture in changing the ways of working if they can see the benefits in that then i think the only thing that would be stopping them would be fear or cost and that doesn't have to be a financial cost but i talk i talk about um, the change equation uh, if i want to if i want to make a change if i want to do something different i'm going to do some kind of rudimentary cost benefit analysis in my head either consciously or unconsciously the benefits have got to outweigh the costs to me of doing that otherwise i wouldn't bother but it's not just simply about benefits and costs because there is always a chance that i try something and fail and human beings generally want to try and avoid failure they want to avoid that that sense of having tried something and it not worked and the the, the potential judgment that comes from that um so i'd, I'd probably look at those three Leavers, is there any way that this could be more beneficial for them? Is there any way that this could be easier for them, cheaper for them? And is there any way, anything that we could do that would increase their chances of success? Which could be, I suppose, partly defining or, 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 or more clearly defining what success actually means for them. The other thing, so the other thing on, on, on that that is quite common, um, especially. It, well just from my experience but especially with with senior leaders is that those people have generally got to where they are because of the way things are and sometimes in their minds even if it's not true there's a perception of well if i have to change what i'm doing i kind of have to admit that what i was doing before was wrong and i say there's a perception there because it's not necessarily true it, it may just be that things have changed and people aren't associating that change with them but from a personal perspective it can feel like i'm losing face um, and having to sort of back down uh, or go or, or overturn something that i said or supported before so is there a way that i could make this easier for them to to change their mind without either actually or seeming to feeling like they have lost face That's great, Jeff. Thank you. And I really like that sort of almost analytical um, assessment of, of where are you rather than just being, feeling really frustrated about it. And I'd like to invite the group now. Does anyone want to sort of dig a bit more into that based on what Jeff has said, um, either the person that asked the question or um, someone else that's interested? And maybe just raise your hand again. Hi. 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 A long line of what you were talking about, and it's kind of a it's a similar kind of anti pattern. I often see leaders looking at the headline like you know, you know, twice the work and half the time, mm -hmm. but they don't see it as a kind of a, a change thing for them. And then they come along and say, "Well, why am I not getting you know twice the work and half the time?" Have, have we yeah. kind of have we kind of oversold? Uh, well, that that last sort of throwaway comment, I think, is um, is possibly worth worth more attention than, than, than we should 
uh, we might well give it. Um, but with with ongoing court cases, um, then maybe maybe not not me, but with the people that have made those claims, it might be worth steering a little bit clearer of them. Um, but yeah, this idea of uh, that that's always been a factor, isn't it? It was even I remember in early days there was this view that agile was about doing more for less, or getting more for less, and, and being cheaper, um, and cutting costs. And actually, a lot of the agile movement, a lot of the leaders of the agile movement actually went out of their way to try and make it clear that it's not about that. It's not, it's not about being more efficient. Uh, and I actually make a, a big, when I talk to leaders now, I'll, 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 I'll call that elephant in the room out. Yeah, if you're going down this agile approach pathway, you're not going to be, it's not about efficiency. It's about effectiveness. And there's a big difference. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, there are a number of now quite public claims about doing twice the work for half the time that perhaps bring that back onto the table a lot more. But I, I, my, my natural tendency is to kind of empathise because no matter how awkward or how uh, how much of a saboteur or how, uh, how how bad these people might look at face value, they're all they're all trying to be successful. They're all trying to do a good thing, but they've got influences on them. Um, and those leaders are often under a lot of pressure from shareholders, from, um, from, from market changes that they're behind the curve on and they, they somehow inherited a massive cost base and they need to do something. And while agile cost might not be the number one driver, really, it's, it's not easy to, to, to pull that out from it. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, that's great, and lots of different perspectives there. Um, Shane, was there somebody else that yeah. wanted to ask a question on that? Cafe, uh, we do have another hand raised, and I apologise for the pronunciation of your voice or or, or your name. But is it uh, Georgia or? Yeah, close enough. It's uh, Georgia. Oh, okay. <laughs> Georgia, George, cool name. George Perfect. is fine. Uh, usually, okay, it's thanks, George. George, Georgie, but whatever. I don't. I don't mind. George, George, George is, yeah, George is one of the global uh, agile uh, leaders. Oh, thank you, Scott. No, but I actually uh, wanted to to uh, reinforce what Jeff said and kind of ask if the person who asked the original question is here because the, the language is quite specific and did they mean dealing with the situation that you're in where you're trying to make a change but the leadership is not maybe supportive? or dealing with the leaders themselves. I, I would be really curious about the nature of the question. Would the questioner like to speak up? No pressure, but please. Oh, that's me, it's okay, it's, it's no pressure, it's okay, thanks Cathy. Um, yeah, a couple of things on it. I think the first thing was, Jeff, thanks for the feedback on the language. The deal with was more just, I was too excited about what I was probably doing at that moment. I was trying to juggle a two-year and a four-year-old, so I was just writing down blurbs, so thank you for that. Um, I think, yeah, for me, look, the background for this is I've worked in financial services for the majority of my career, and there's a number of problems in terms of the leaders probably aren't really hiring the people to come in and, you know, to help with, like, agile transformations. And I think also, um, you can't even get near them even if you really wanted to sort of like deal with some of this stuff so it's probably trying to deal with that disconnect like even if you do get two minutes with these individuals by the time you've even thought about trying to get into what they want or what success looks like it's generally quite challenging um, and they're quite dismissive so and also in financial services i think you've got the background of and jeff i think you said it quite nicely um where they've got to has probably been from having a massive ego and being quite arrogant and dominating and so forth so Did I actually I really want to come in and <laughs> No, you didn't. I added that last bit. Okay. I put some. I added the ego and so forth. But that's sort of what I believe I'm dealing with in terms of that sort of we, stuff. So we have recorded the. Bit, we have that. recorded it. I don't yeah. think, think any of my bosses are on the line. Uh oh, Luke. I, I can see one or two. <laughs> <laughs> I can see Carrie. Yeah, that's about it. Brilliant. And but yeah, that's where the background was. That was really coming from. Um, and to even get them engagement or to get them at the door to even be talking to them is quite challenging. Yeah, it's. And, and um, I get that it's in, in many cases it's a little bit easier for me um, because I'm an external who is bound with by confidentiality, um, and you know I can be sued and taken to ethics courts for if if I divulge any information. 
but you if i if, when i was working at bt if i did have managed to grab five minutes with a leader why would they tell me the truth why would they be vulnerable with me they've got nothing to gain and a lot to lose so finding out what's really going on for them where their fears are what their hopes are what their drivers are it's really really difficult for somebody within an organization but for somebody who's engaged at, at a leadership level it's a little bit easier for me to to get to get there um and so i suppose i take this slightly more optimistic slash pe uh, you know, positive view of, of human nature and that very few people that are trying to screw you over even though it might appear it because i can see the human frailties and the vulnerabilities behind what might come across as quite assertive behavior um, a lot of that is defensive behavior it doesn't look like it but it is um, and it's protectionist behavior thank you jeff and thanks luke great to get that extra clarity um, I'm going to suggest we move on to another question. So the next one, uh, the next number of the highest votes was, what does good collaboration look like? It's quite an open one there. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, seeing as Luke, Luke floated the word ego, I'll start there. I would say, for me, the first, the first thing that I see when, when I know, well, the first thing I notice when I see good collaboration is you don't really see a lot of ego um so whatever status there is whether it's uh sort of hierarchy or even if it's just sort of social respect or even personal respect you don't see the difference um and i think one thing that i, I kind of almost mentioned with the first question around encouraging people to share a problem and collaborate is for me a big part of collaboration is is optionality so I don't, you can't force collaboration. I could force cooperation and I can force coordination, but I can't force collaboration in my opinion. I know there are people out there that would disagree with me based on technical de definitions of, of collaboration, but I, I, from, from what I see, I can't force that. Um, and, and I think that's a big part of the ego thing. I can't force someone to let go of their ego. They have to want to, or be willing to. And then we're all then we're all feeling a much higher level of psychological safety to interact with one another to to challenge each other to question assumptions to uh embrace the idea that that the impossible might be possible um to to go past what might seem like uh, an easy win to look for something deeper or bigger or more impactful to give away my idea to somebody else for it to be built on and not look to claim the credit for having that idea. I feel safer to do that. I don't need to score points. I don't need to come out of this with the credit. Um, I think look like I, I do have a sort of nasty habit of, of picking on words and what does collaboration look like? There are things you can, something can look like collaboration, but it doesn't feel like collaboration. And so it's not so much, what I'm, what I'm trying to see is their collaboration here. It's not so much what I'm looking for, it's what I'm feeling in the room, uh, which might sound a little bit touchy-feely, but it's that sense of people looking a little bit insecure about whether they're doing enough. There's always a sense of a little bit of apology because they don't feel like they're doing enough. Because historically we've been expected to do our bit, but actually doing our bit when we're collaborating is sometimes not filling the airspace. Sometimes it's not polluting in the airspace. So generally speaking, people feel a little bit uncomfortable. I've got, I've got a, a fragment of a, of a TED talk, but I can't remember which one it was. It'll come to me later on. But it was about uh, comparing um, the, the effectiveness of teams solving problems when they had a stranger in the team. They were more effective when they had a stranger in the team than when they, all, they were all friends which on the face of it is is interesting but what was more interesting for me was that that even though that group with a stranger in were more effective they were less comfortable while doing it so they were kind of acting a little bit above comfortable or outside of the comfort zone possibly because of the stranger um and i think there's an element of that in there as well if that makes sense Jeff, thank you. Do you mind if we 
if we go to the floor and see if anyone wants to delve into that a bit more. I'd prefer that rather than me just carry on waffling. Yeah. Assume, anyway. <laughs> Kathy, we've got Ian T uh, with his hand raised and then David Crow. Um, cool. So Ian T, thanks, Shane. Hi, Ian yeah, T. thanks. Um, myself so hopefully uh, you can hear um yeah i was just going to ask about in, in in general um given that senior execs and uh, we're talking about kind of collaboration in general uh i think around um 70 percent of senior execs are alpha um and um so obviously different approaches needed to and um, coach um how, how do you deal with with those so we're back to dealing with people again. Um, but the the interesting, I, I I would I'm keen to see more and more up to date studies on this because my it may well be that I'm biased by the the samples that I'm coming across, but I'm seeing that percentage of alpha within the boardroom shifting. I, I would say it shifted certainly in in the, my twenty year career. Um, and people with those skill sets, the, the greater emotional intelligence, greater listening skills, greater enabling skills are progressing up because the problems that people are facing and having to solve are different to the ones that were there when the alphas dominated. Um, but that, again, that's just my experience. But the, if you have got a, a group of people, so I'm going to extrapolate your question here and tell me if I'm, if I'm abusing this. But um, if you've got a group of people who aren't naturally collaborating, either because there's a lot of tension or there's a lot of sort of conflict in there or positioning, ego or what have you. The one thing that I think is a, is a great place to start um, is, is to try and find out the mutual benefit, the common why. Because, what is it, there's a quote, isn't there? If, you, if, you, if you, a man that has a compelling why can, can tolerate almost any how. Most people are willing to sacrifice a little bit of themselves if the collective that they're part of is good enough, big enough, meaningful enough, impactful enough. And I, I didn't okay, choose that word sacrificing lightly because being part of any team does require a certain trade off. If I'm going to be part of a team properly, like really in this team, I do have to sacrifice a little bit of myself, a little bit of selfish need, a little bit of, not completely, but I do have to sacrifice a little bit of myself. And the key to the successful teams is that what each individual gets back from that trade-off is bigger, better, more meaningful, more, um, more purposeful than what they're trading away. And that goes for even at the board level, even with those alphas, if they can get something better in return, They'll do it. Did I abuse your question there? Are you any happy with no, that? No, cool. That was good. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thank so, you, Ian and Jeff. So, yeah, Jay, it was uh, David Crow had his hand up. Um, David Crow, would you like to come yeah. in? Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, Jeff said something really interesting about um, unpicking language um, and he said it almost apologetically and actually I think what he said there was really key. So when we're having conversations with people we're trying to understand their perspective and if we don't understand their perspective we don't understand how they're constructing whatever it is we're discussing we're going to be completely unable to address their needs and their wants. So I think this habit of reflecting on the language that we're using is absolutely key. I mean, the word deal with people sounds like you can just dismiss those people, but actually key stakeholders are really important. You're the product owner of agility within that organization. And if you don't understand what your customers and stakeholders want, how are you able to deliver an effective product? So um, I just wanted Jeff to sort of talk a little bit more about deconstructing ideas and the importance of that in reflective and effective practice, uh, particularly in this area of where communication with somebody is difficult. 
And so I feel I feel compelled to to play the other side of the argument. This is just a, a sort of almost flaw in my character, if you like, in that I'll happily make a really strong point, but then as soon as st people start agreeing with me, then I feel compelled to make the alternative point. I, I'm a bit weird like that. But um, so I, I, I picked out those words from, from Luke a while ago and, and he had a reason for it and there is a reason for it. And it's not so much that um, the words dealing with were meant to deal with. Um, of course, yeah. But my point is to be able to replay that back to that person without me putting my judgment on it, but to ask them whether that is impacting their, their view um, subconsciously. And I think that you know, one thing that the, the most common the most common language aspect that comes out for me uh, above all is the difference between should and want so a lot of people use the word you know i, I should be doing that i need to do that i, I ought to be doing that uh, i must do that that sense of obligation uh, and obligation is a powerful thing it is but it's nowhere near as powerful as want and if i can play back to people that the fact that i'm hearing a lot of obligatory language in what they're talking about not to explain themselves to me because they don't need to explain or justify themselves to me but it can hold the mirror up to them in terms of why perhaps they aren't as making as much progress as they would like or they aren't as fulfilled as they would like and what would it take for them to to shift this from a should to a want but then we have then we open another problem another can of worms in the, as soon as they're aware that I'm listening for their words they're very mm -hmm. careful about the words they use um, the good news is the longer people talk the more they lose their attention so if you're a good listener and you stay quiet long enough you can eventually give them something that they can use to reflect themselves mm. Jeff and David great conversation um do you mind if we move on i'm just conscious we had so many questions i'm trying to get the balance between mm. asking the questions that we had already and also getting some follow-up questions thank you so the next one that we had was how do you get teams to focus on the actual problem before jumping to the solution mm. that's uh, yeah that is a good question it's a really important question um, and I, my, my, my instinct, my instinctive place to start is the sort of natural reason why we do jump to a solution. And so I, I usually have this conversation with a team that's, that's starting out or a scrum master that's, that's, that's trying to set up a new team or, or, or working with a this team that they, they don't, I've given them a chance and they just they just won't make a decision they don't know what they, they want to be told what to do and so you know i give them a chance but then i have to tell them um and this idea of well that, that while there is uncertainty about what to do or you know, the solution to to go for we have anxiety people don't like knowing sorry, people don't like not knowing the answer um and, and not knowing what's going to happen and so when, when any, anything that vaguely resembles a possibly acceptable solution, to get rid of that anxiety, a newly self-organizing team will, will say, okay, yeah, let's do that. Just to close out the uncertainty and move on. And that might be fine, you know, and in many ways, that's kind of an agile approach, right? It's good enough, let's move on, and then we can iterate and get it better later on. But we have attachment to our decisions. Um, and it's very hard to go back on what we've decided before for fear of looking like we've made a mistake and so on. So, um, and, we, and often it's the, the more extroverted people that have those first opinions out there and the introvert and the more introverted people don't get heard. And so we don't have a well-rounded view. So it's generally a, a very suboptimal decision that we make. So allowing teams or giving the teams the, the tools and the space and the confidence to actually you know, sit in that discomfort for a little bit longer is really really valuable and if we're in the complex space we need multiple options ideally we want to be running multiple experiments in parallel but at least we want multiple options um, and one thing well a couple of things that can help there one is normalization so letting people know that it is absolutely normal for them to want to close out uncertainty and anxiety by making a decision 
that's normal. And once it's normal, we stop judging ourselves for it. And some teams will actually say, well, we don't want to be normal. We want to be better than normal. So now they've got an excuse to push themselves outside of their comfort zone. The other thing that helps for me here is, is, is rituals. So you think, think, think back to the very first retrospective that you were part of, you know, how, how much divergent thinking did your team really engage in? Or did they come up with one thing? They thought, yeah, we should do something about that. And then they say, yeah, all right, we'll do something about that. And that's it. And, and we'll move forward. But having a bit of structure, so this is where, you know, Esther and Diana's um, Agile Retrospective Structure was really, really helpful for teams is saying, okay, well, don't worry about down the line, just start thinking about what's going on at the moment. What problem do you want to solve? Then start a bit of time gathering some data, then do a bit of, you know, uh, generating insights and then decide what to do. And getting into that ritual allows people that sense of comfort, that it lowers the anxiety levels. And uh, another ritual that, that, I, that I wrote about years ago in Scrum Mastery, I, I picked up from a guy called or Lee Devin, was the rule of seven. And knowing that we've got a rule that says we can't make a decision until we've come up with at least seven options allows us to be a little bit silly, allows us to be a little bit loose because we've got a rule. The ritual is we need to have multiple options. And coming up with seven options is quite difficult but it allows us to, to get past the blindingly obvious um, and, 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 and open ourselves up. And I'll stop there again in case I'm just waffling too much and, and you want to target or, or, or guide yeah, me. Waffling is great and really like, again, pulling out a bit there, the power of the Scrum Master and how important the Scrum Master can be in helping people to find these rituals and normalisation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. So, um, Shane, has anyone raised their hand to ask a question on this? Yeah, Kathy, we've got Nikki Bennett um, and then uh, Matt Evans. Okay, so let's go to Nikki first. Thanks, Shane. Hi there. Um, so, I guess it's a question around brave spacing. So, a lot of what we've talked about tonight seems to be psychologically safe. Um, mechanisms and brave spacing so do you have any other tips on that yeah um dedicated time uh, so dedicated time to be collaborative to explore a dedicated space that doesn't necessarily need to be off site but an actual space where we can go it could be a virtual breakout room for example and i'm much more likely to be crazy to be innovative to be creative in a group of four than i am in a group of 54 so making it easy for people to to get into that that kind of mindset um trust if i trust people i'm more likely to to explore and try something a little bit crazy uh working agreements uh, which you might say if you've got trust you don't need them but trust isn't binary you know there trust goes on a scale uh, so those working agreements can support trust while it's developing and while, while we're growing as a team and sometimes a little bit of fun can help uh, one one fun technique that i roll out quite often is the psychopath uh, the psychopath approach which is how can we make this situation worse and what i find is a lot of people find it much easier to think about how to destroy something than to build it up so if we're if we're really struggling to get creative or to be collaborative or come up with some some new ideas coming up with how you can make it worse immediately gives you some ways of stopping that risk from happening and you then can flip it and then you're on into a bit of rhythm got a bit of momentum in terms of some some forward thinking brilliant thank you and you're welcome thank you nikki thanks jeff and matt was it yeah um it was just uh, as you kind of touched upon it towards the end but truthfully you might have kind of answered it there with Nikki so I'm not sure but I, it was in and around um, experimentation you mentioned there you know you want to have ideally multiple experiments running at the same time that's your ideal kind of situation how do you encourage that kind of level of experimentation to go up how do how do we nurture that how do we make that um, you know a more natural thing as I said you might have answered some of it with some of the stuff that you said to Nikki but any other tips on sort of growing up? <laughs> um, so it's it's not necessarily that multiple parallel experiments are a good thing. 
but they are in the right context. In the wrong context, multiple parallel experiments are a horrendous waste of time. Uh, so it's about helping leaders understand, make sense of the context. So the Kinevin framework, talking about the Kinevin framework with, with leaders being able to work out, okay, well, in this situation, I know it probably is the right thing to get some experts together, do some analysis, find out some good practices and, and make a decision. But if you're on the wrong side of that line, you're going to get waste either way. And I think I haven't yet come across a leader that doesn't get the logic in that. The question then is how good are we at knowing which side of the line we're on? And so then we can talk a lot about cognitive biases uh, in that if you know, I, we don't, we, none of us see the world as it is. We see the world through our own lens and through our own experiences. And we, we hear what we want to hear and we hear what we expect to hear and we see what we expect to see. And so I can talk to leaders at a, at a logical level about cognitive biases and they get the concept that they see things that perhaps others don't see because that's what they expect to see. And so if that's the case, then which is the worst side of the line to be wrong on? What I mean by that is if, if, if it turns out that I should have run multiple at parallel experiments, but I ended up doing some analysis, is that worse than I should have done some analysis, but I did multiple parallel experiments. And generally the worst kind of wrong leads you to thinking, well, I should probably err on the side of experimentation. When you factor into account that my cognitive biases historically lead me towards analysis, problem solving, using my experience and my expertise, then I'm probably seeing more of that than I should be. Then logically I should be a little bit more this way. But I'd also couple that with empathy in that if I was a leader, if I was somebody who, who had the purse strings, I would feel much safer getting some experts together and spending my money on that than spending my money on experiments. Unless those experiments were cheap and quick, safe to fail. Did, I, did that answer your question, Matt? Yeah, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's a good take on it, to be honest. So, yeah, probably not the way I would have looked at it. So, thank you. It's brilliant. Cool. Thank you, guys. Great conversation. So, I'm going to suggest that we move on to another question, unless I get a shaking head from Shane or Jack. Uh, I can't see any hands raised at the minute, Kathy. Okay, let's move on then. Thank you. So, next and possibly last question, depending on how quickly we answer it, we might have time for two. Um, is there a way that you measure collaboration in teams? Ooh, uh, measuring metrics. Metrics always, always introduce dysfunctional behaviour. Um, and while it's kind of true you get what you measure, once you start measuring something, the behaviour changes. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hesitating because I don't want this to. I don't want this to sound like this is a, a plug, but. What I've tried to do with, with this team mastery book is not so much provide some kind of metric scale, but what I've done is, is created a number of what I've called milestone cards, where these are, these are sort of significant events, tangible events within a team's growth, where they've, 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 they've sort of taken a step forward in terms of their, their ability to be a really, really good team. And those are, they're not necessarily linear. So it's not like a case of this is your first milestone, then your next milestone, and you know, you're at maturity level one, maturity, it's not like that. But there are a number of things that a team can think, right, well, if we do that, that's a really good sign that we're a great team. You know, so showing appreciation for one another, for example, might sound like a really um, sort of fluffy, high level thing, but asking for help, that's a, that's a, that's a sign that a team is prepared to and is probably pretty good at collaborating. If we can ask each other for help, we're more likely to be an effective collaborative team. So I, I, I asked the team what they would be looking for, what, what would be their signals that they are collaborating effectively. And then look for examples of them on a daily basis or a sprint by sprint basis. So what is, what, when you ask this team, what, what's their experience of being part of you know, a really good collaborative team give me some things that they notice or what isn't there when they aren't collaborating for example and capture them and then look for examples of them or work towards them 
Great, yeah, so decide what it is that you care about and then look for signals as to whether they're happening or not. Yeah, and I think calibration, while there are some common hallmarks, I think depending on the context and depending on the team and depending on the maturity and the, and the, and the mix of people in the team, collaboration might look different from team to team. And it's not, I don't think it's, it's if I came along with a, with the standard textbook definition of collaboration and said to the team, right, aim for that, I don't, even if it was a brilliant definition, I don't think it would be anywhere near as powerful as a team saying, this is what we think collaboration is and that's what we're aiming for. Um, but I might be wrong. Great, thank you. And a real watch out for coaches and scrum masters. I think that we don't give other people our own <laughs> definitions of things. But um, I, I wonder if um, I think I'm getting signals that someone wants to ask a question, Shane. Is that right? Uh, yeah, definitely. There's a, a couple of hands raised. Uh, we've got Andrew Kendall uh, would like to ask a question. Um, and then we've got a couple more. Okay, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Jeff, I was just going to say looking for signals for for collaboration and cognitive, like cognitive biases. I suppose metrics and analysis are typically used to try and uh, inform people to challenge maybe cog like those sorts of biases. Do you think, um, yeah, what what would you say to someone that would say, like, show me it, that, that was looking for like more structured evidence about perhaps improvements in collaboration? Um, unfortunately, we're not the best judges of our own biases. We can get better at it through reflection um, and through developing our emotional intelligence, but nothing beats having somebody that we trust and respect look out for that for us. So uh, as this is a really simplistic example, right? But um, I've got dreadful knees dreadful knees from sporting injuries over the years and so now now my knees are so bad I can I can dislocate my knee playing darts right it's they're just awful and so the amount of times that I have to go through rehab and, and, and exercises to build up the muscles again and I'm lazy generally I, I, I skip my exercises and I know this about myself right and I and my, some of my cognitive biases you know I can rationalize why I haven't got time to do these things in the morning or I'll do it later on but one one trick that I have is, is I basically hand over power to my, my kids. So when I'm going through this, I will draw up my exercise routine and I will put it on display and I will ask my kids to hold me to account. So if they see me skipping something or if they skip, see me not doing what I should be doing, they can, they can call me on it. And it's quite a silly example because it's not really work related. But if, we, if, we, if we've got an idea, if we're asking for feedback from our colleagues, people that we respect, people that we're contributing towards success with, and oh, we lost Jeff. Sorry, Kathy. Oh, I thought I, th I think I lost you. It might have been me. Uh, we're, I think we all did. Did lose you. Yeah, just, just just literally thirty seconds or so. Yeah, Where, think... What was the last thing you heard me say? Kids, kids, kids. holding you to your account if you skip something. Okay. So it's, it's kind of a silly thing, but it's quite powerful for me because it, it comes back to my personal values of, I, you know, that's, I don't want to be the kind of parent that says to their kids, you can't do your homework. Um, and giving the, those, the people that I care about that power makes it easier for me to stick and get past my cognitive biases. Taking that into the, the workplace and the team, you know, we're, We've hopefully, we said earlier on, we've got something collective that we're working towards that's bigger than, than what I selfishly want. Then I, I, I can, if by getting other people to help me see my cognitive biases and inviting them to give me feedback on them and knowing that it's not a judgment, a personal judgment, I'm broadening my self awareness by bringing other people in. And if someone starts that process, then it says to everybody else in the team, you can do that too. It's not a weakness to ask for people to help you build up your weaknesses. And, and that's something that I absolutely see in the great teams that I work with. And I'd be interested in whether you guys see something similar in, in the great teams that you see. So that's a great question. And uh, I'd like to point there about you, you going first. I often say that to Scrum Masters, even today I said that you need to go first. Um, Shane, someone had the hand up, I think. Yes, uh, Georgia. George. 
Uh, yeah, well, in the meantime, I think it's been covered. I just wanted to throw on the table a small example of kind of measurements. Uh, we just uh, put up, uh, well, basically it was Heart of Agile and it had a collaboration part. So we just basically put an open season. Whenever you notice a collaboration moment, just uh, put it on a sticky, post it on the wall. And if you feel like it specifically say why it was valuable. And at the end of uh, pick, a, pick a time, sprint or whatever, we would look at those and then see which of those were really valuable to people because it just supported that behavior. So it's not a measurement per se. And we didn't say, hey, let's get more of these or let's get at least 20 of these. But it was kind of towards that, towards that goal. Okay, yeah. And, and the visualization, I think, is a powerful aspect of that as well. Yeah, excellent point. Yeah, and I would, I would actually argue that the biggest uh, value was people had no idea what other people were grateful for and what other people considered useful collaboration. Yeah, good point, good point. That's great, and, and get, great to get different ideas from you there as well, George, thank you. Um, Shane, am I right in thinking, or maybe Jack, that we need to wrap up is that so right we have to schedule them for quarter to nine um, yeah no quarter to nine I don't see good I think we should keep Jeff up all night <laughs> <laughs> you got enough beer in that shed not quite no I'm, I'm, I've got I'm down to the drags now can't keep them up with those knees <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff what do you think I'm conscious that um, I think we, we said we'd finish at quarter two so Shall we call it a day there? Yeah, um, um, have you got a, a burning final question? Um, I, there's quite a few. <laughs> Select one. Yeah, that'd be great. One. Shall we choose one and we'll just do a really quick answer to this Go one on then? On. Um, what's the first thing you do when you're brought into work with a dysfunctional team versus a new team? Uh, not treat them like a dysfunctional team. Uh, because I, I've had so many experiences with teams that have been viewed as dysfunctional, the problem team, and they just haven't had their needs met. They haven't been set up for success. They're, and and it's kind of like a kid acting out in a way. Um, and so I would I would actually try and treat them like a new team, give them a chance to start afresh, uh, go back to basics, try and find out you know what what would they like to do what would they like to be um, what do they need to get there um, and and learn a little bit about each other again so I, I would probably treat them as a new team yeah that's great and really showing that generosity and something we always need to bring as coaches and scrum masters yeah thank you Jeff so I'd just like to wrap up by first of all saying thank you. I'm sure that everybody else feels the same. It's been really interesting to hear you speaking, really enlightening. And I'd like to invite you also just to give us a bit of chat about your book, because it feels to me like a lot of the stuff we've talked about tonight probably really resonates with the topic of your book. So can you just tell us a few more words about that? Sure, and we've left it to the end so people can, can ignore this bit if they don't like the sales pitch. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I, I got word from the printers today that, bless them, bless them, they've been operating with a skeleton staff this week to get it all printed, and I should be getting my first copies delivered tomorrow. So it's, it's, a, it's following a very similar format to Scrum Mastery and Product Mastery, so it's real stories that have been anonymized. This time, slight difference in that I, I invited people to collaborate with me virtually, remotely, even before we had to be remote, um, to share their stories. And it's, it's focusing on the, the hallmarks of all the, the great teams that I've seen over the last 20 years. Some from software, some from outside software, um, and focusing on the fact that great teams have a habit of self-improvement. They focus a lot on quality. They have a hallmark of unity. They're audacious, they're brave, but they don't forget about delivering. And as well as those stories, there's 50 of these milestone cards that I mentioned, things that the great teams that I've seen tend to, tend to hit, and they're quite significant in their development. Um, and you, your team may choose to aim for them or might think, yeah, yeah, we've done that. That's, that's a good thing. 
put on there's some blank templates in there as well because every team's going to be different um and yeah if you're interested hook me up check check out my website i'm not going to sell it any more than that definitely we look forward to that and i know that you've got some little cards in there as well that you can like pull out and yes check terror yeah awesome right thank you very much jeff and i propose that we all have a round of applause i don't know whether we can do that with our cameras off can we do yeah, that we can have a cheers right yeah. Where's Jeff? Thank you. 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 Fashion, we want to make sure we're getting your feedback and we're improving for next time. So I'm going to ask if you can stay, it'll only take five minutes to have a little quick feedback session. If you have access to the, a computer or a phone, that would be awesome. We're just going to do a very quick online feedback session, which I'll let you, uh, Shane, take you through. If you have to drop off, I will share the link afterwards. It would be awesome if we could get your feedback now while it's fresh in your heads. Can I pass over to Shane? Yeah, not a problem. Uh, Jackie, you want to share the the code and stuff like that for Mentimeter? Excellent. So normally we would try and get this feedback, you know, uh, with some post-its, some sharpies, um, but we're going to try uh, menti.com uh, uh, this time around since we're all remote. Um, so this is real simple. You can just go to your internet browser on your phone or on your laptop. Um, type in www.menti.com and then you'll be presented with uh, the request to enter this code. So just enter in the code 565977 and then you should, um, there we go, we've already got some people starting to uh, input. Perfect. That uh, some Mary Poppins. So yeah, definitely had some of these sort of keywords coming up: insightful, inspiring, lightning, um, super, califragilistic, <laughs> XP, excellent. Just give it a few more moments. I think we've got. So that about covers everyone. Um, Jack, can you move to the next uh, feedback? So. Um, the, that that one word that you entered uh, quite nicely looked at what, what what went well. We also want to kind of um, we want to know what way can we or what can we improve um, uh, as a as, as a meetup as a community. Um, so if, if if you can enter some things that, that that we can we can work on improving on this um, entry. <laughs> uh, virtual pizza. Do you reckon we could get Donald's to deliver to everyone's location? Does virtual pizza come with chips? <laughs> um, maybe a virtual beer or a cola or. Uh... Been there, lots and lots of virtual pubs springing up everywhere, so I'm sure we could do that. <laughs> Is that I love the name of the world. Plug, Scott? <laughs> the world's end. That's yeah. my favourite name. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, yeah we, we, we had uh, Gita, Gita in Sweden trying to do karaoke. It was fun. <laughs> Paul, uh, Paul Goddard and I are doing a, a live version of the Agile podcast tomorrow in the Social Distance Inn. Ah, very clever. Um, so I think uh, I think that's all the entry. Oh, we've got some more coming in. I think we had 35 on the first one. Yeah. And, yeah. Just a quick shout out on the remote sessions thing. Um, Joanna Masraf uh, is a single parent and can't go out to meetups and has set up uh, every three weeks a uh, kind of remote sharing session. Um, and uh, it's called the Hive Remote. Um, really good, really good talks. Um, you know, John LeDrew, great speakers, um, speakers from Australia and things. So it's, it, and that's uh, that's kind of set up. It happens every three weeks, um, and it's really good if you're not in Edinburgh, or, or you know, and it's really good now, whilst that uh, you know, whilst we're all uh, you know in COVID lockdown. Yeah, um, that, that I've, never, I've been to them a few times. Of they're, they're great. Um, yeah, I even did one from the. Yeah. I even did one from the gym. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, right. So um, again, uh, we'd really like to like understand what you would like to see in the future in terms of topics that we can bring to uh, to the Heart of Agile Meetup. Um, so again, uh, if you can just put your thoughts. <laughs> Somebody sounded like they're having fun. How's that uh, locking going? <laughs> well, that wasn't feedback for us. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Something I've um, I've really enjoyed recently, you know, um, with having to work remote more often is is, is getting to meet um, people's extended and and and, and uh, immediate families. Um, so so getting to meet a lot of my colleagues. Uh, uh, ch children, um, partners, um, and it's starting to, I, th I think, build that sort of better understanding of, of, of who the people on my team are, and even people outside my team. Um, okay. So I think uh, we'll move and this is the final and last bit of feedback that we're going to ask for. If Jack's going to... Oh, this is actually the last bit, isn't it, Jack? Yeah. yeah. I thought there was a fourth bit of feedback. Oh, that's wrong. us. That's <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think i uh, hand back to Cathy uh, just to wrap up. Is it me or is it Scott? My apologies, it's Scott. I think it's Crazy Scott. It's crazy yeah, Scott. Crazy Scott. <laughs> I, I, I want to end this on a bit of a positive beat. Um, we're in a time of change, and we are the change agents. We are the change people. We're in a time where people need to, in work, be more human, and we are the people that, uh, you know, humanise work. Um, I predict that, you know, although maybe some people have had their contracts and things stopped initially, and there's a bit of a shock in the system, you know, pretty soon that, you know, out of the COVID crisis, that, you know, the things that we do are going to be really valued. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, where people are maybe kind of scared of the future or scared for the roles, uh, you know, th this community has got real leadership in this time and going forward. And if anything, COVID is just accelerating the better place that we for years have been trying to get people to. Um, so there's a lot of hope out there. We will get through this. And I think this is going to make us stronger. And I just really wanted us all to, to end on that happy note. Uh, you know, we're doing the right thing. <laughs>